Okay, I want to talk about the slot antenna and uh, dive into the analysis of why this is an antenna, why it radiates, and try to give uh, an overview of just how it works. I find that most of the textbooks out there are generally not very useful as far as learning about the slot antenna, so hopefully this video uh, can shed some light on it. So here's a basic slot antenna. You have some um, ground plane, so we have metal in this region, and we have a gap within that metal. Now, typically, uh, for the analysis here, we're going to assume the gap uh, height here is much, much less than lambda, and this length here, uh, we're going to analyze it as for uh, being lambda over too long. So it's a pretty simple uh, thing. The feed uh, is, you can think of it as a voltage source from one end of the slot, uh, to the other, and it's offset from the center, and we'll see why that is. Um, so, why is this an antenna? Like, why does it radiate? So, let's look at just our slot here. So, we have ground plane everywhere else. This, in this region, is air. So, what what's going on? So, we have a voltage source here. So, what is the voltage distribution uh, across the slot? So, for instance, the voltage from here to here, we know, has to be basically zero. And because there's a short distance H between the two, so we'll just assume that's zero. Over here, the voltage has to be zero as well. And so assuming that this is roughly a half wavelength, then we can imagine the voltage is going to be a peak in the center, and we're going to end up with a distribution that looks like this for voltage. So peak in the center zero on the ends. Now what about the current uh, associated with that voltage? Now again, from we can view this slot as actually a transmission line uh, that has two paths and is short-circuited on both ends. So here's, think of this as the left transmission line and this is the right transmission line. So when we have short-circuited transmission line, the current and voltage are going to be out of phase. And so the current along uh, the top surface uh, will be a peak at the end. It'll go down to zero, and then it'll be a negative out here. So we have the current and voltage profiles like this. And so assuming the current goes in this direction on the top, the current is going to be going in the exact opposite direction as well. Now, for an antenna to radiate, we either need the current to add up in phase or the voltage to add up in phase. So for a dipole antenna, it's the current that's adding up in phase that's giving rise to radiation. Here we have current going one way and then canceling out. Uh, current going the other way right next to it. So this isn't, the current here is not giving rise to radiation, but it's actually the voltage distribution from top to bottom, we always have the voltage going this way. And so we have an associated E field with that voltage. And it's this E field, due to the voltage adding up in phase, that's giving rise to the radiation. So this is why uh, we can get this structure to radiate. So what about getting power to the antenna? So if we fed the antenna right in the center here, the current is zero. And the voltage is a peak, so Z, V over I uh, would be, you know, infinite, theoretically. In practice, it would actually be really high. If we fed it over here, the voltage would be zero, and the current would be large, in which case the impedance would be zero. So we move the feed away from the edge and towards the center, but not too close to the center, such that we can get the impedance uh, to match whatever desired impedance we have, typically 50 ohms if we're working with a standard coaxial cable. So, we understand why this radiates, and we kind of have to move the feed out of the way to get the power to the antenna. Now, another way to look at that is you have your source here. So, we have a transmission line here that's going to be uh, less than lambda over 4. So, you imagine here you have lambda over 4 here and lambda over 4 here right in the center which means this is going to be less than lambda over 4. When you have a transmission line that's less than lambda over 4, it's going to be look like an inductance. If it's greater than lambda over 4, it's going to look like a capacitance. So on this side, 
you're viewing a transmission line that's short circuited, which looks like a capacitor. And you can go and look at the Smith Char tutorial or uh, just the transmission line tutorial to understand why that is. So we have an inductance on one side, capacitance on the other side, and we're also left with the radiation resistance of the antenna here. So when this is properly chosen, the inductance and the capacitance cancel out, and all we're left with is the radiation resistance. So now we have power going to the antenna, and an antenna that supports radiation because the voltage adds up in phase. That is the principal method by which uh, the slot antenna radiates. And often, slot antennas are discussed by uh, duality. So that concept here is, again, I mentioned this dipole, which is fed in the center, and it's a wire, which produces current that goes like this. And typically, it's a half wavelength long. And you get this, which produces a current. And the E-field ends up in this direction. Now, if we have look at the slot antenna, which is basically, if we replace all the air around the dipole antenna with metal in a single plane, and then cut out the shape of the dipole, we would have the slot. So this is kind of considered the complement to the dipole antenna. And then we have to feed it across this way. So here we have air in the center and metal in a plane surrounding the, the dipole. So the duality principle says that when you have a complementary structures like this, then the radiation patterns in terms of uh, the magnitude uh, are going to look the same, which means they'll both radiate in this plane principally. The difference is this antenna, the dipole, will be vertically polarized, whereas we know the E fields giving rise to radiation are in this direction for the slot, which means the slot will be horizontally polarized. So also, often Babineau's principle is discussed, which says that the, so if you have the impedance of the dipole and the impedance of the complementary structure, the, the slot, and we have the impedance of the medium, which here is the air, or the air within the slot, or eta naught for free space is 377 ohms, which is square root of mu zero over epsilon zero then the following equation holds. The dipole impedance times the slot impedance is the intrinsic impedance of the medium squared divided by 4. Uh, so that's often given in, you know, college textbook antenna theory classes, so I'll throw it out there. Um, the bandwidth of these, then, are fairly similar, so for a patch, you're looking at like seven, or sorry, for a dipole, it's around 7%, same for a slot then, which means, you know, if you have one gigahertz as your center frequency, it'd be plus or minus three and a half percent around that. Um, and then the slot note doesn't have to just be this shape, really, you can come up with any shape that you want, if you have a ground plane around that and you want to feed some region that looks like that, you can get that to radiate as long as the perimeter, which is the path around here, is roughly, you know, lambda, which kind of corresponds to a lambda over two slot. So that's the fundamental analysis of a slot antenna, understanding why it radiates, how you get power to it, and in general the basic properties in terms of polarization and bandwidth and impedance.